All right, welcome to uh, Wednesday's lecture for this MC201 course. Let me show you what's on deck here. Digital culture for this winter session, 2017, 2018. I know things are moving at a pretty quick pace, so I hope that you're able to keep up. So far, you've taken a couple of quizzes. Looks like everybody's taken the quizzes the first couple of days. Uh, I'm going to try to post lectures no later than 10 o'clock in the morning each morning. Um, the first couple of nights I got them done uh, the night before, but today I'm posting in the morning. Uh, I just wanted to make sure and update this lecture to match the uh, the new version of the chapter. It kind of combined a couple of things. Um, so far, so good in terms of people taking quizzes and looks like you're reading and watching the lectures. Um, haven't had a lot of luck at setting up um, Zoom meetings with people, partly because yesterday was kind of a mess. I was sometimes there, sometimes not. So if you can let me know when you would like to meet, we can just uh, catch up for a chat for about five minutes or so. Um, I'm hanging out in Edwardsville over Christmas break, winter break. Get a little, little shot of the scenery here, the backyard. It's not a lake. It's a parking lot. I wish it were a lake. Um, so let's get to it. We're going to cover this in about a half hour, digital culture. Um, the overview here is uh, essentially, we're just trying to cover terms. We're still just trying to define terms and concepts for you. And at the very end, we'll sort of put things together by talking about the network society. Uh, this is where we're leading to. But let's start with just defining digital culture, uh, um, looking at how it's conceptualized and practiced. We'll talk about social capital, get a, def a definition of that as it relates to this class and to mass media. Um, we'll talk about reciprocal media, the possibility for mass participation in all types of professionally produced mass media. And like I said, we'll hit on network society at the end. The first thing I want to ask you uh, is just how organized is culture to begin with? In a lot of ways, um, societies are organized <clears throat> according to laws and bylaws and rules and also informal rules and even myths about how things are supposed to work uh, in these you know, very large organizations that get things done. That's society. Culture, on the other hand, is pretty messy. Uh, this is a photo from um, my sister's wedding, and that's my son, uh, and he is the ring bearer, and the flower girl is my niece. And as you can see, um, people can be <laughs> feeling different ways at some monumental um, cultural events. Um, you know, weddings are pretty well organized and orchestrated and commercialized in our culture, but in other cultures, maybe not in other cultures. Uh, you might have a wedding celebration that takes five days. You might have a wedding celebration that takes a week. Um, and then there are people who go off and get married in Vegas, and it takes them, you know, a couple of hours, and they get back to gambling or whatever. Um, culture is a little bit more difficult to define than society because, uh, you can call something a wedding, but it's done a lot of different ways in a lot of different cultures. So what does it even mean to, to have a wedding? That's, that's the concept I'm trying to get across with this picture. What are we doing here? <laughs> that's my son's face. Uh, my niece, uh, she knows what she's doing. You know, she's dressed up and having a good time. So uh, let's get into digital culture definition. Uh, when you read through this chapter, you're going to have to read through the chapter because um, there's a lot more depth and detail in there. It's not, not the longest chapter, but you're going to have to read it to understand what's going on. I'm just going to give you a big overview here in the lecture. Uh, but when we define digital culture, we called on Mark Doiza, uh, and he um, basically just looked at emerging digital cultures in online spaces, blogs, and chat communities, and things like that, and he noticed that uh, people were generally speaking as individuals in the digital cultural context. You know, when people were interacting with each other and talking about what they cared about, what their passions were, what their knowledge, beliefs, and practices were, they're, they're most often doing so as individuals. Uh, and the, the idea is kind of, um, you know, one person sitting behind a computer screen, kind of like I'm doing now. That's how a lot of us interact with the world through social media, whether it's at a computer uh, or um, on a smartphone, right? But at the same time, you have access to a global network of information, so it's globalized. Uh, the the uh, economics, the uh, infrastructure for the internet, um, you know, it, it can be bound and sort of regulated or, or controlled in some ways by different nation states, 
but generally speaking, it's a global mass media collection of all types of information. And so that's another thing to always notice. There are people from all over the world interacting uh, and the ability to do massive amounts of trade and to communicate massively about you know the products and services that you have to offer. Those are all happening on a global scale. And in, related, in relation to that, you see something of a post-national culture evolving where people don't immediately identify themselves as being from a country. They identify themselves according to uh, you know, culturally, according to um, political beliefs or their common interests, uh, people will form digital cultures online around all kinds of things. And I go into that in the text, right? <clears throat> but the idea is um, in digital culture, in these online spaces, um, yes, the country still exists, but that's probably not the primary way that people are identifying themselves. And then I had to add a caveat to that because uh, of, you know, um, white nationalism uh, and, uh, you know, uh, sort of like the Brexit vote and a lot of American politics right now, a lot of this is organized, uh, uh, kind of created and maintained in online spaces. And there is a sense of nationalism and neo-nationalism going on in the world right now in, in certain areas. And so there's a, an ongoing kind of battle, if you will, a cultural battle between people who, uh, you know, celebrate nationalism and are very concerned with nationalism uh, and kind of the rest of the world just I, I would argue just trying to get by in the economy as it actually is uh, digital culture in practice again this is doys and now um, differentiating between how we define something and then how it actually works how it actually plays out the way people do or create digital culture is through participation, remediation, and bricolage. So in terms of participation, people are not content to just sit back and be audience members. People don't just sit back and take stuff in and, you know, kind of wait and watch their, watch their, uh, their watch, uh, or, or check the clock, um, waiting for their shows to come on. They go out and binge watch things on Netflix. Um, we engage, you know, there's so many different types of digital culture. I don't even want to start talking about all the different various ways of experiencing culture online because we could be here forever talking about, you know, your favorite um, things to binge watch or websites to visit or fantasy sports teams that you manage. I'm in the playoffs. My 7-6 and six team made it to the finals. Don't ask me how. There's a lot of parody in the league, and I snuck in there in the sixth spot, got into the playoffs, and now I'm playing in the championships, right? This is why we can't talk about digital culture because people could just go on forever. Right, so what it is, do always notice is participatory. It's not enough to just sit and watch football anymore. You want to have some. You want to have your own team. You want to have your own way of viewing the game. It's not enough to just sit and watch news. You want to uh, comment on it on Twitter. Um, there are specifically divine, specifically created cultural events on television, like the live Christmas story uh, presentation that was on TV uh, a couple nights ago designed to force people to watch it in real time and then encourage them to engage on social media and talk about it, which in theory is going to bring more people in to watch it on TV. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to get people to sit and watch TV at a certain time anymore. And so um, going to live programming is one of the ways that the legacy media have figured out uh, works to, uh, to sort of continue to perpetuate or to try to hold on to, to some of their mass audiences and so that's one of the ways that the sort of dynamic that we had talked about uh, plays out I'll talk more about that later but you know this is a lot of talk for basically getting across one point digital culture is participatory people want to have something to say or something to do with the media products they consume they're not just passive consumers they're what's called producers uh, that's P-R-O-D-U-S-E-R-S. -E producers are people who are users and producers on media platforms. <clears throat> Remediation means taking old media and making it new by presenting it on these converged digital platforms. So you have film, you have TV, you have radio, uh, and those things all have their sort of digital uh, video counterparts and you can mash up all of these different things into new productions, uh, new creations. Um, it is it is common 
for a new medium when it comes out to take whatever was available in the old media channels and remediate it and present it to you. So one example is the nightly TV news is actually structured kind of like a newspaper. There's the, the main uh, story, the front page story, if you will, and then there's most often some type of um, uh, national or international story that follows it up, like you might see on the inside pages of the front section of a newspaper, and then you get to uh, business, and then you might get to sports, and then you might get to a, a feature story. And so you can pick apart a broadcast news show and actually imagine the different uh, sections of the newspaper where these would have come out of. And they're still structured a lot of times in the same kind of hierarchy, like, you know, big front page story, national and international news, then we're going to hit business, then we're going to hit sports, maybe we'll throw some medicine in there, then we're going to hit a feature story, and that's it. You're done, right? So it's as if you read the top couple of stories in every section of a newspaper. You get a fraction of it, but supposedly the most important stuff. That's how the TV remediated the newspaper. And on the internet and on mobile um, communication platforms, it's a free-for-all. Just about anything that was ever made can be remediated and brought back. All right. Uh, bricolage is a fancy French way of saying do it yourself, DIY. Um, beyond participating with professionals in the products they make, people are making their own stuff. They're making their own Tumblr pages, they're making their own, uh, you know, art. Uh, I, I'm trying to think of like, <laughs> I guess there's a website called Deviant Art where people make their own graphic design and like they'll reimagine different characters from, uh, you know, existing cultural products like oh like Pokemon or just just you name it Star Wars um, Lord of the Rings um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer like whatever kind of you know sub fan culture there is out there somebody's making art related to it right that's bricolage it is taking from a lot of uh, available resources and making your own thing sort of the do-it-yourself culture now that the capability is there for everybody to do that lots of people are taking the opportunity all right, <clears throat> I mentioned that I would touch on this later. This is the digital and physical culture dynamic, and what's important here is that the two types of culture, the physical world culture and the digital culture, influence each other, and they will continue to for as long as we can imagine in the future. Um, if you want to personalize it, I, I didn't write it this way in the textbook just because it's, it's a little bit better, I think, spoken, but you can, you can take this on an individual level. Think about how you have two different personas. You have the face that you put out on Facebook and Instagram uh, and... I don't know, Tinder, if you're on a dating app, whatever, like you put out your best face usually on, on a lot of those apps. You try to show people you're having this great life uh, on your, uh, if you're still doing Snapchat or if you're doing Instagram. Um, and, you know, definitely it, if you're on Facebook, you're putting out there the biggest and most interesting things that happen in your life. Uh, generally speaking, that's how people use it. Um, your real w world is, you know, perhaps relatively boring or mundane most of the time. A lot of times, uh, you're just, you know, sitting outside looking, looking out off the porch at whatever's going on, right? So, I don't know if you can see over there, but that's actually, that's actually, I shouldn't tell you where I live, but um, that's uh, not far from downtown Edwardsville over there. Anyway, you have in your own life two different identities, at least. You have an online persona and a physical world persona. What you do with one can affect the other. If you get a little too crazy with your online persona, it might make it difficult for you to get a job in the future. <clears throat> if you, um, you know, spend too much time uh, hanging out with friends and, and partying, and you don't, you know, maintain your digital portfolio, it's going to be hard to uh, complete your degree in mass communications. So, on a large scale, what this means is knowledge, beliefs, and practices online and in the physical space influence one another. That might seem obvious. But if you think about it, this, this could have all kinds of consequences that we haven't really anticipated yet. Um, if people start to worry more about their online persona than their real world persona, you can get kind of what I would call the World of Warcraft effect, where people spend a whole lot of time building this online character, and their real self becomes uh, <laughs> over, overweight and, you know, drinking a lot of snacks and eating Doritos and stuff. I don't play World of Warcraft, but I just look like I do. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's move on to social capital. What is it? What are some examples? Social capital um, is this idea that there's a value besides monetary value 
in living in a society. Social capital comes from, you know, not just, you know, being able to get jobs and, and work for wages, work for salaries, hopefully benefits. Uh, it's about all of these other uh, valuable things that come from living in a society and sharing culture with people. So this is, this is you know, again, sort of an overlap between um, the survival aspect of social institutions. You know, this is an overlap between society and culture. There's a lot of value in social institutions, but there's a lot of value in sharing culture with people too. All right, so all these things feed into social capital, participation, reciprocity. Uh, so reciprocity is when, when you share with somebody you expect sometime in the future they might share back with you. And if somebody does a favor for you <clears throat> sometime in the future, it's likely that, hey, you might do them a favor as well. Um, you have a lot of these feelings of trust and safety that come from living in communities and, again, sharing culture with other people. So, you know, societies are set up to formalize different types of survival techniques and practices. But culture is also valuable. <clears throat> culture also makes us feel safe and secure and understood. Um, and a lot of people are losing kind of the, the general <clears throat> the general social capital that comes from living in communities um, because people don't go out and participate in communities as much. People often prefer to stay home and watch NFL football or, you know, stay home uh, and binge watch movies. Um, people are, are watching a lot more, uh, binge watch TV or movies. People are doing a lot more like home theater film consumption than going to theaters, even though, you know, Sometimes a Star Wars movie comes out and people go see that, obviously. Um, and so when we talk about social capital, we're talking about, in the physical world, often a decline in social capital. Um, there's a decline in civic engagement, generally speaking, in the United States of America over the past 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and some would say that um, by not knowing our neighbors and relating to them on a consistent basis, we're missing out um, on feelings of security and also feelings of having uh, shared norms. You know, people used to have shared norms that went, uh, you know, aside from their political points of view, we used to just, you know, generally agree that we need to keep schools going and we need to, um, you know, keep, I don't know, the, cre the creek clean and, and keep the neighborhood clean and stuff like that. Um, I'm not saying that's completely gone or, or that it's going to go away, but you know, in, in some ways, social capital is in decline, and it was thought that we could develop new social capital in online digital spaces. But there's obviously pros and cons to digital culture. There, there are ways of building social capital and finding new ways of connecting with people and finding new ways of finding security and comfort and support in digital spaces. But there's also a boatload of trolls, right? So that's the downside to social capital online. <clears throat> uh, basically, once again, I'm saying the good and the bad of a concept, in this case social capital, uh, can be perhaps more extreme in the digital culture than in the physical culture. I do want to talk about levels of culture for just a second. Think about the size of culture, right? Culture exists on, you know, we talked about um, the cultural production, the material culture having, um, you know, high art, uh, pop culture, and folk art, or folk culture, right? Um, now I want to talk about culture in, in three levels, but in a different sense. And this is like the size. You have your own personal preferences. You have group cultures, which used to be called subcultures. Um, but, you know, scholars decided that's not a very fair way to define people. You know, just because your particular interest or your particular ethnic group happens to be in a minority, that doesn't make it a subculture. It's just a different group culture from, you know, the one that has more people in it. Um, and then there's common culture, which... Uh, again, it's always contested. It's it's not like everybody it's not like everybody agrees on what should be a part of the common culture or how common culture should function. They're just things that are massively popular, and that all those massively popular things together help make up a big common culture. So it's the size that we're getting at, right? United States of America to be American means to have a common culture, but a lot of people are going to contest what being American, what being a true American really means, right? It means different things for different people, obviously, but the big one, the big massive uh, cultural group is called Common Culture. Uh, so that's just a joke. I put, you know, uh, rap artist Common up there um, just to make you think like, oh, is rap music uh, part of the Common Culture or does it belong to a group culture? And the answer is both. <laughs> rap music belongs both to, uh, you know, originating out of, you know, um, a, a group culture, uh, you know, mostly African-American uh, uh, um Hip hop, R and B music, evolved out of, got you know, rock and roll, jazz, blues, and and, and the entire history of, of, um, you know, I think what the industry might call black music in our in our culture, right? 
but it's also now part of common culture. Um, so when you see somebody like rap artist who is kind of on that borderline between really being loved in a group culture, but also being appreciated in the common culture, um, that's meant to convey to you that there are sort of borders, like things can exist in group culture and be very popular in group culture and not quite permeate the common culture, but then every once in a while people will so-called break through, like you'll have a Latin artist who comes out of Mexico or, or South America but becomes popular in the United States. Um, you know, so the, these levels are not like fixed or very clear cut, except maybe the personal level because your personal culture is, is kind of up to you. It's the things that you like, the things you have passion for. Your, you know, your the cultural pleasures, whether they're appreciated by everybody else or not, whether you're, you know, a nerd or geek or, you know, you generally like popular things or whatever, um, those, those choices are still up to you. And also don't want to forget about mentioning norms. Cultural norms are things that, generally speaking, uh, people in a culture agree you should and should not do. This is a behavior that's considered normal, right? You should not rob people, right? You should not vandalize property, right? These are like very common basic norms. But sometimes norms can be challenged and some of the norms emerging in digital spaces might differ either in type or in priority uh, than in the physical world, right? There's probably a little more tolerance for bad language and trolling in online spaces than there is in real life. In real life, you don't just walk up to somebody who's at the, at the supermarket and say, uh, yeah, that coat looks dumb, bro. That's a dumb coat. Like, you probably don't do that. Uh, but maybe some people would say, uh, would comment online about someone's appearance much more readily, right? There's less risk of them, I don't know, punching you in the face in an online environment. Um, so it can definitely be a breeding ground for trolls. I have a very dear friend named Michelle Ferrier who actually created a company called Trollbusters. Whenever people are being trolled online or being harassed or threatened, particularly women, particularly minority women, um, they go and they try to counter that effort, isolating the, the person who's being attacked, uh, pushing back, um, you know, they, they know the proper channels for, for referencing complaints to um, the social media, you know, platform, whichever it is. So, you know, there are people out there trying to bust trolls. <laughs> it's just a difficult battle, right? So, norms exist. These are the way we say people should behave in a culture. They're, they're maintained more culturally than in terms of society. Society establishes laws. Culture is more related to ethics, right? And so I don't want to be like a total cultural relativist who says, oh, live and let live. If, you know, if it's okay to occasionally stab people in the ears in that culture, like, eh, maybe that's how they do things. Like, you know, we, I don't want to be a total cultural relativist, but there are things that some cultures are cool with, like kids under the age of 21 drinking that our culture is technically not okay with, you know, legally or culturally, depending on your family or your church or whatever, right? And so cultural norms, uh, they're there. They're always going to be contested, just like other cultural preferences. Um, and just know that in digital spaces and digital culture, the norms are sometimes different or they're prioritized differently than in the physical world, All right? Brings us up to reciprocal communication. Um, there's an element of participatory communication that works like other types of social and cultural reciprocity, right? Reciprocity, uh, the theory, comes from anthropology and the idea that a bunch of people get together in a community and they share stuff and then they expect later on, hey, my friend's got my back. Like, if I share a bunch of corn when I'm having a good year, the next year, if things are a little light and I'm afraid I'm going to starve to death halfway through the winter, my neighbors will uh, pitch in and throw a couple, you know, throw a couple extra, uh, I don't know, uh, throw a couple extra containers my way. I don't even know what, like, what would you keep corn in, and, uh, <clears throat> in a, I guess in a, in a clay jar or something like that in uh, <clears throat> prehistoric times, right? But this tradition of sharing and sharing alike goes way back as far as, as long as we've had culture, right? And it's, it's the, the sort of technical term for it is reciprocity. And reciprocity happens in media, and it's going to happen more often, uh, potentially. Well, it probably will happen much more often just because the, the capacity is there um, in digital spaces, right? So you have people who collaboratively edit Wikipedia pages or who share information on Facebook. 
don't know if you noticed, but Facebook is trying to become freaking everything. They're trying to become Craigslist with having Facebook sales. They're trying to become uh, obviously your news hub, obviously your information sharing hub, your photo album. Um, it, it didn't I, obviously. I mean, Facebook's been around for a decade now, and it's not so surprising when they add new features. But when they added this sort of classified ad marketplace, I'm like, oh, they're trying to kill Craigslist too. Like, I kind of thought Craigslist was just going to be there forever as its own little thing on the site. But I guess, I guess Facebook won't be happy until they have a, a, a feature for every element of our lives, right? Um, there are lots of ways that you can participate uh, with one another. This is from an article by Canola and Alavizu. Um, and this is old. This is from 2010. There are new and, and different ways of creating uh, culture together uh, by participating together in media. But the takeaway from this is the same way reciprocity works in other culture environments where you share with somebody and you think they'll share back with you. That can work in... <clears throat> digital cultures in terms of forming um, and maintaining social capital. So if you put yourself out there and you share and you're offering support for other people, there may be a time when they come back and they support you. If Whether it's just emotionally, you know, people are being supportive of, you know, if something goes wrong, like a tree fall on my house, uh, this actually happened uh, last summer, and so I posted a video of it and kind of got a lot of sympathy for people, which felt good in the moment because there was a hole in my roof, right? And so uh, people were asking, you know, do you need anything? No, you know, we're getting the tree removed and blah, blah, blah. But um, these these types of social capital, um, they, they can be done through uh, interpersonal communication on social media channels. Um, but we're also seeing some reciprocity form in actual mass media channels. Channel 5 on your side is a pretty good example. There's a lot of like on your side news now um, that maybe, you know, encouraged or ramped up. That's actually a research area that I'm looking into. Um, uh, is it related in any way to the emergence of digital culture that the uh, sort of legacy media outlets um, started doing the on-your-side stuff? I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I have a hypothesis that it might be true, right? So reciprocity exists in interpersonal communication on these massive platforms, but also in mass media. Reciprocity just means hoping to get back when you give something, share something with other people, and vice versa. All right, if we can understand digital, cultural, digital culture a little better now, what can we say about society forming online? What can we say about the network society? What is it now? What could it be? <clears throat> I don't have a direct and easy definition for you to check off uh, on a quiz. I would I would just say that um, the, the more formal structures of society are being organized and put together in digital spaces right now, and they're uh, in a lot of time in a lot of ways right now managed by commercial entities like Google and Facebook, and so that's why I would really stress the whole terms and conditions concept. Like they're the people making society online right now. You know, aside from culture or in addition to culture, adjacent to culture, right? We have network society forming. And it's kind of a free-for-all, um, except in commercial spaces where there is some organization, right? So it's Google's Digital Network Society right now. It's Facebook's Network Society. Uh, it's Baidu's Network Society. Um, it's WeChat's Network Society and Twitter's Twitter, <laughs> right? So what what you need to know is it's, it's still forming, but it's probably going to function quite differently from... The physical world. In the physical world, to get things done in a society, you probably have to build a building and have a physical space for people to go and do whatever, right? I can take you all the way back to this picture from the beginning of lecture, and there's a church there where people hold weddings. There's also a hospital in the background. That's where I was born. Yeah, it all comes back to me, I guess, but um, institutions, social structures, they need physical spaces to work. You don't have to build physical spaces in, in digital uh, environments to make society function. So what are the platforms? What are they? You know, Obviously, there, there are actual physical servers somewhere that need to run to make a cloud or to make uh, you know, the, the back end of Facebook, all the databases and stuff function and, and show you what you're meant to be seen by the algorithms at any given time, right? So those, thi those things are all actual physical things. But the structure of the network is, is not um, a series of spaces built for specific purposes. It's actually just kind of massive, one massive space. Sorry, I keep dropping the 
computer off my foot. Um, it's not a bunch of individual spaces where specific tasks are done. It's just a, some massive spaces where f information flows through, right? It's platforms where all kinds of um, uh, different types of uh, media can be presented and it's permeated by mass communication. Mass mediated messages are on Facebook all the time and they're showing up right next to, you know, somebody's photo of, uh, you know, the spread for their, their holiday luncheon or whatever and right above somebody else's comments on the latest Star Wars movie uh, or whatever they're binge watching on Hulu right now, right? And so we have this, this system where it's kind of structured but only loosely. So you have a space of flows. Digital or network society um, is global. We're all globally connected to it. It's relatively anarchical, right? There's anarchy out there and the spaces that are managed um, are just set up to allow information to flow through. So what we don't know is how society is going to function when it's built on information uh, instead of on more tangible... That's a Blue Jay. It's pissed off at me for being out here talking too much. I'm ruining his morning. <laughs> um, you know, in tangible physical spaces, you're limited by how much money it costs to build buildings and where do you put roads and everything. It, you know, in digital spaces, anything could go anywhere. And so right now, the, the most built-out aspect of the, you know, organized structure is probably the commercial aspect. All right, I feel like we've covered that enough. Um, but, you know, if you, if you can even begin to grasp the idea of a space of flows, you'll be doing really well, I think, for this introductory level class. But the idea is it, we, we don't just have places where specific finite uh, actions have to occur in a network society. Uh, we, we just build spaces where massive amounts of information flow through. Um, and it's not clear how sturdy society can be if it's built on um, flows of communication, right? I said communication in the first intro and first chapter. Communication permeates everything and makes up everything. But in the physical world, then we build buildings, then we build infrastructure. There's a more permanent to it. There's there's some permanence to it, right? Um, Facebook could disappear tomorrow. I mean, it's not going to, but it in theory, it could just go away. You know, they're... they're servers could get shut down or they could have power outage on top of power outage and you know then how would you communicate with people if you've been relying on messenger to talk to them um have you ever had somebody who you're who you communicate with online and you don't actually know their phone number you just message them um you know you, you would potentially lose a lot of um your your capabilities in a society if you rely on these um you know, not yet fully formed structures. Um, and there's a question if, they're, if they will ever be fully formed since we're talking about the space of flows, all right? So I hope that this uh, provides for you a nice overview of digital culture. It is a relatively long communication. I appreciate this, it's been over, over a half hour because my hands are cold. Um, I'll definitely throw some uh, quiz questions out there. Um, I didn't make them abundantly clear right now, but there's only eight slides. So obviously you're going to need to know about um, digital culture defined and participation. Um, you know, know the difference between the, the elements of practice in digital culture and the, the definition of digital culture, right? Um, so, you know, when in doubt, if you're really worried about how to, how to take a quiz with me, just look at the actual terms in the bullet points, right? Um, I'd like to talk about what digital culture is by definition, what digital culture is in practice. Those both will be on the quiz. Um, that there's a culture and physical dynamic. Um, I might mention how it relates to your identity, that that's like the smallest um, uh, aspect or the smallest element of this bigger uh, cultural dynamic going on between the physical world and digital space. Um, I'll probably maybe ask about Mm, yeah, I'm more likely to ask about social capital uh, and just what is it, you know, it's the idea that um, there's value besides money out there in forming uh, cultures and sharing, uh, you know, sharing interests with each other. Um, and the network society is characterized by being built on information rather than on physical infrastructure, so something like that. So hopefully that's that's helpful as I go and um, hammer out this quiz and put it out to you guys. Thanks a lot for uh, following along with this lecture. I hope this class is, is fun and informative for you. 
uh, and we're moving through. It's already the third week. It's already Wednesday. Tomorrow we'll have one more chapter to look at and another uh, video lecture and quiz. And then Friday you'll have the first test and pay very close attention to the quizzes uh, in preparation.